Hey guys, this is Robbie Atlas with RPP. Welcome to part three of this webinar on pitch design and development. Here's a brief outline of part three. During this section, we're gonna go over a few topics to get us ready for part four, where we'll be discussing how to improve movement patterns. We may jump around a bit, but each topic is extremely relevant and they will answer some basic questions you may still be thinking of. Let's start with some advanced movement patterns of some of the best pitchers as a guide. Here's the slide we showed you earlier in part one. These are pitch effects numbers for some of the best pitchers in the MLB. They aren't totally compatible with Rapsoda data, but they give us an excellent idea on relevant ball movement in the major leagues. Let me tackle one topic right off the top. How much separation is enough? Well, I can only say that in a game of inches, obviously the more the better but a few inches between similar types of pitches should do. For example, look at the cutter in green versus the slider in brown. Or let's look at the four seam in purple versus the two seam in red. If you took a close look at the prior slide, you should have gotten a good idea for how much advanced pitchers move the ball. Part of the reason they are so successful is their ability to tunnel pitches that end up in completely different parts of the zone. With a good understanding of how movement is created, you can also attempt to do the same. The idea with pitch design and development is threefold. One, improving pitch specific ball movement. Two, creating separation and differentiation among various pitch types. Three, creating new pitches to fill holes in movement patterns. Now, let's go over a few basic topics. We get asked about spin efficiency by pitch type quite a bit. So let's quickly review what spin efficiency means before we get into our suggested ranges. Spin efficiency is true spin divided by total spin expressed as a percentage. It's a measurement of how much of the different types of spin are actually contributing to movement. The higher the percentage, the bigger the movement. 100% spin efficiency means there's no spiral spin, or what we call gyro spin. 0% spin efficiency means it's 100% gyro spin. Spin efficiency is kind of a misnomer because people associate higher efficiency with something that's better, but in this case, that's not always true. It's really pitch dependent. A typical slider probably won't have a 50% spin efficiency. It wouldn't be considered a pure slider. The best way to explain this is that whether the percentage is good or bad depends on the pitch. For example, fastball should approach 100% while sliders should be around 20 to 35%. This is a summary of our suggestions on spin efficiency by pitch type. Frankly, others may disagree with some of these, but this has been our experience and they have worked quite well for us. Four seam and two seam fastballs in the 85 to 100% range, but the higher the better. It just means additional movement on the ball and less cutting means more velo. We will touch on this a little bit later. Change ups 80 to 100%, once again, the greater the better. Cutters at 35 to 60%, should get more vertical movement than sliders at 20 to 35 percent. Curveballs vary a great deal, but generally they should be a greater percent numbers than slurs to get the necessary depth. It depends on the curveball and the arm slot on the pitch, but 50 to 100 percent is a reasonable range. We have seen the full range with effective velo and depth on curveballs. Slurves generally sit somewhere between a slider and a curveball. Of course, all these percentages are in relation to the gyro ball at zero percent spin efficiency. Spin axis is one of the most relevant topics when it comes to pitch design and development. Let's go over some basics of spin axis and relative spin axis among different pitch types starting with the four seam. Your four seam should set the stage and we really would prefer not to mess with this pitch too much unless we have to. Since every pitcher is different, the best way to look at this is to evaluate the relative movement of our other pitches versus your four seam. So establishing the fastball is extremely important as a starting point. We have seen fastballs with a spin axis close to 12 o'clock and others close to 3 o'clock. They can vary, but each has implications. An over-the-top guy may have a 12 o'clock spin axis, and a sidearm guy may get close to a 3 o'clock spin axis. If your two fingers at the point of release are 100% behind the ball, your spin axis will generally follow your arm slot. A typical righty pitcher 
would have a four seam spin axis somewhere between 30 minutes and an hour and 30 minutes on the clock. Are deviations possible? Absolutely yes. These are just suggestions. But for the sake of the rest of the slides, let's say your four seam has a spin axis of X because, as we said, everything else should be relative. Let's go to the two seam next. If your four seam has a spin axis of X, then we suggest that your two seam move further along the spin axis clock by as much as another 30 to 65 minutes. This means, for example, that if your four seam is at 40 minutes, then your two seam should be in the 110 to 145 range. That range would represent from good to great separation. Unfortunately, we see too many pitchers with two seams that move so similar to their four seam. It's actually amazing. It looks like most pitchers have never really learned how to throw a two seam, but I guess that's a big opportunity for pitch development. Given the various grips for a changeup, its movement pattern is highly individualized. As a result, our recommended spin axis range is wider than the two seam. We have seen changeups with lateral movement inside the two seam and outside the two seam. Both are effective and appropriate. Generally, we would like to see further movement along the spin axis clock by as much as another 20 to 80 minutes. This means that if your four seam is at 40 minutes, then the axis on your changeup could be as little as 60 minutes or as high as 120 minutes. Generally, if the spin axis is higher than the four seam with less velo, the pitch has an effective movement pattern. Here are the three pitches we just reviewed in their corresponding movements and axes. With the four seam at 40 minutes, the two seam is at an hour and 34 minutes. That's an additional 54 minutes on the spin axis clock, which would make this two seam a very different pitch. On the other hand, the changeup is at an hour and 58 minutes, an additional 78 minutes on the clock versus the four seam. With lower velocity, this changeup is a highly effective pitch. Slider spin efficiency is where we talk about how sometimes lower the efficiency, the better. On a slider, we're looking for efficiency below 40%. We also like to see a spin axis in the 8.30 to 10 o'clock range for this pitch. If you go back to part one, you can see what Bauer was talking about with the gyroscopic slider at 9 o'clock. When we talk about cutters, we like to see an axis in the 10.30 to 12 o'clock range. We want a lot more vertical lift on this in the slider. Sometimes we tell our right-handed pitchers to think about throwing a left-handed two-seamer as a cue. On a slurve axis, it's usually between 8 and 9 o'clock. On this pitch, we're looking for negative vertical break. A lot of kids throw this because, like we said, they don't really have a pure slider or a pure curveball. That's why an axis between 8 and 9 o'clock range is what we're looking for. A curveball axis we want between 6 and 8 o'clock. We want this because we want as much negative vertical break as possible. The closer we can get to 6 o'clock on the curveball, the better. Below 6.30 is the absolute goal, however, below 8 o'clock is still okay. Let's quickly look at these four glove side pitches and their spin axes. As you can see, I overlaid a clock on this chart so you could visibly see a general spin axis range for each pitch type. Please keep in mind these are generalized and there could definitely be some amount of overlap. Although early on I said we aren't discussing velocity in this webinar, I want to quickly review something that we have observed on spin efficiency and velocity. It's not directly related to pitch design, but I think it's worth a mention. Here is a separate but very related topic. It's a relationship between spin efficiency and velocity. Some may disagree with our observations, but we believe this to be true and correct. Spin efficiency has a direct but somewhat hidden relationship with velocity. According to StatCast, the typical MLB fastball in 2017 was about 93 miles an hour. We estimate the spin efficiency to be about 95%. The typical MLB slider in 2017 was 84 miles an hour, and we estimate that spin efficiency to be about 25%. When I was in pro ball, I try to throw my slider with as much intensity as my fastball, assuming other pitchers do as I did. And there is a 9 mile an hour velo difference and a 70% spin efficiency difference between the two pitches. We're basically implying that every 10% reduction in spin efficiency equates to a 1.3 mile an hour drop in velocity. Now we know these aren't set in stone, 
but we have seen a pitcher hovering around the 50% spin efficiency on his fastball gain 3 miles an hour on his very next pitch when we corrected it and brought the efficiency up to about 85%. Others may disagree on some of this, but once again, this has been our experience. We can say with pretty much 100% certainty that guys throwing 95 miles an hour or more in the MLB have a spin efficiency hovering close to 100%. In these next several slides, we're going to talk about what the Rapsodo machine is actually showing us. Before we get into the next section, I think it's a good idea to spend a few minutes and go over what information the Rapsodo provides. First, I would like to say that this camera is top notch and frankly the whole organization is top notch. They are always available to help and their customer service is also excellent. Now let's talk about what comes out of the camera. First we have spin axis total spin, true spin, spin efficiency, vertical and horizontal break, movement charts, strike zone charts, ball trajectory visuals, and velocity. It's basically everything we have been reviewing so far and much of what you would need for pitch design. Here we have a typical Rapsodo screenshot. What it'll show us is the velocity measured in miles per hour, a pitch selection type to choose from, total spin above the baseball, true spin to the right of it, spin axis is in that same grouping, spin efficiency, then it'll give us a movement chart to the right, the strike zone on the bottom, and a selection of ball trajectories to choose from. Using the excellent historical reports that Rapsodo supplies, we're able to look back and see how much we have progressed over our sessions. Rapsodo also breaks this down on a pitch-by-pitch -pitch basis, so we could really dig into a specific pitch and see what adjustments we need to make. Be sure to give us a follow on social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, at RPP underscore performance. Well, this brings us to the end of part three. Please proceed to part four, where we will pick up on improving movement patterns.